What is happening, y'all? Cowboy here, and welcome to my starter guide for Wolong Fallen Dynasty. Now, this guide is the product of close to 50 hours played. Uh, I've played on both PC as well as the Series X. I've beaten the game at this point. I'm now working on New Game Plus. And everything I want to cover in this video is stuff that I wish I knew up front going into the game, stuff that would have made the experience just a lot smoother. So the topics in this video are going to be an explanation of the five phases or five elements. Uh, we're going to be taking a in-depth dive into the stats as well as discussing the soft caps or the breakpoints on those stats. We're going to be doing a quick overview of wizardry along with some personal recommendations for spells, a combat breakdown, and some tips pertaining to deflects and combat in general, a discussion of the morale system as well as death, and then lastly, we're going to wrap things up talking about respecking and battle sets. Now, I do plan on having a secondary video that'll look in depth at set building in the blacksmith, but that's a topic that could easily take up 20 minutes on its own, so I decided to separate it out from this guide. Uh, also, in terms of spoilers, things are going to primarily be right here at the central hub. For the combat portion, we're going to be going to the same demo, or the same level that was in the demo, uh, so no spoilers there. You may see the names of followers or guardian spirits or a mission title, but obviously we're not going to be spoiling any late game bosses or anything like that. But with all that being said, let's jump into it. And the first thing I want to talk about are the five phases. Now, these are based on the principle of yin and yang. In particular, there are counters in these phases, and these are things that were established years ago. But so the five virtues or five elements are going to be wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. And each of these has something that it's going to be able to counteract. Uh, now, I've come up with a pretty good uh, memory mnemonic to help remember this, so just bear with me. It's going to sound a little bit out there, uh, but wood is going to counter earth because trees are going to sap power from the earth. They're going to sap all the nutrients from earth. Earth is going to counter out water because if you see a stream of water and you were to you know, drop a mountain on it, it's not flowing anymore. It's not going anywhere. Water is going to counter fire. This one's pretty obvious. Water will extinguish fire. Fire and heat in general are going to counter metal. They're going to, to melt down uh, metals into the most basic form to where they're, they're formless. And lastly, metal, especially when formed uh, in the form of like an axe or, or even in a chemical type environment, is going to be detrimental to wood. Trees are going to chop down wood. Uh, chemical metal is going to destroy wood in nature in general. So those are going to be your five counters. Now, each of these elements has a certain status effect that's associated with it, and that's where these counters come into play. For example, fire, as you can probably guess, will cause your character to burn and lose health over time. But if you were to use a water effect or a water buff, you're going to cancel out the effect of fire, and you're going to remove that burn and remove that damage that would be happening otherwise. To go into each of these effects, the wood phase causes shock. This is going to deal continuous damage to spirit for a certain amount of time, and it's also going to reduce the upper and lower limits of spirit, which we'll talk more about that during combat. The fire phase, as I already mentioned, is burn. Uh, this is just going to be damage to health over time, pretty straightforward. The earth phase is going to cause heaviness. This is going to cause the target to take increased spirit damage, and it's also going to reduce the amount of spirit they can recover from attacks and deflex. Metal is going to cause poison, and this one is really important for debuffs because as long as the target is inflicted with toxin, the duration of other debuffs is going to be extended. And on top of that, it also deals continuous damage to both health and spirit, so very debuff-centric. Lastly, we have water, which is going to stop automatic spirit recovery, and on top of that, it's going to increase the speed that spirit will automatically decrease if it is positive. Now, if you ever want a refresher on this stuff, the game does a really good job of adding context to all this. If we go into documents up here and effect icons, we can tab on over and we can see all the effects I mentioned right here. In addition to that, if you were to go over to status, you can hit the description button at the bottom of the screen and we can pull up a breakdown of pretty much any stat in the game. I've already seen some people be like, hey, what does agility mean? Here we go. How light you are on your feet. This varies depending on the weight of your gear, the greater your agility, the less spirit that is spent on martial arts, deflecting and dodging also become easier. So anything in this game you're unsure of or that you, you know, you saw in this video, but you still weren't sure about it. There's a good chance there's already a built in description for it in the game, and they've done a really good job this time around, including this stuff. 
Um, but having covered all of the virtues, the next thing I want to talk about are the uh, stats themselves, as well as the soft caps surrounding those. Now, given you could just jump on in and look at them with the description button that I just showed you, just to do a quick overview here, uh, all of the stats are going to increase your health. So you don't need to worry about any one thing to increase your health. However, the wood virtue will increase health more than the other five. A good way to think of it is if you get like 10 points of health per point here, you're only gonna get seven points of health per point in the other values. Uh, but besides that, wood is also gonna increase your spirit defense. That is how, how strong your spirit gauge is and how much damage that would take when you end up getting hit. It's also gonna increase spell duration. So this is mainly going to be buffs for your character. And as you can guess, the wood tree has a lot of self buffing. We have a lot of buffs in addition to the lightning wizardry spells on there. Uh, so it's a good tree that focuses around improving you and people you're playing with. The fire virtue is going to increase the spirit gain rate of attack. So that's how fast your spirit's gonna ramp up in addition to decreasing how expensive your martial arts skills are. Uh, the fire virtue in general is going to have a lot of wizardry spells focused around aggression so some of the fastest wizardry spells in the game are here uh, there's some some high risk high reward buffs stuff like you know expensive spells but it'll double the effectiveness of your next cast or martial arts stuff that'll increase the damage you do but increase the damage you take uh, it's all about aggression with fire the earth virtue is going to increase how much spirit you gain when deflecting, as well as your equipment weight. So you can kind of see this is very much the de defensive stat here. If you want to wear heavier armor and do a more defensive playstyle, Earth is going to be for you. And that is also true in the Earth Wizardry tree. We have a lot of stuff that focuses around increasing survivability and sustain. Uh, a lot of the offensive spells are more CC oriented, you know, locking enemies up and slowing them on down. So a, a very good tank oriented tree. The metal tree is a bit interesting. Uh, it's gonna have spirit sustainability, which just dictates how long your spirit bar will last before it begins to decay. It's also going to decrease the consumption rate of all wizardry spells, but the metal tree itself focuses on two main types of spells. The toxic spells, which as we mentioned, toxic will maintain the duration of debuffs. And then the second half of the tree is all debuffs. So stuff that'll make the target deal less damage, take more damage. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting playstyle because it's all about the just debuffing the target and making it so they can't function all that well lastly we have the water virtue now not only is this going to increase all ranged weapon attack damage it's also going to increase the stealth stat which will allow you to get more critical attacks more easily sneaking up on enemies or jumping from above and it's also going to decrease the amount of spirit that's used um, as you are deflecting now aside from those there are soft caps or stat caps that you may be familiar with if you've played souls likes before uh, in general these are some of the numbers i found just in testing uh, you can test all of this yourself with the respect feature we'll be talking about that later on in the video but in general you're going to see your first damage drop off around 30 and what i mean by this is as you're leveling your weapon you're going to see like three attack power two attack power three attack power two attack power right around 30 that's going to drop down to two attack power one attack power so 30 is going to be your first real damage soft cap to keep in mind. And that's why I've stopped my secondary stat there. Uh, as for spirit defense, that goes all the way up to 40 in wood before it really starts to, to drop on the returns. So that's going to be like a late game dump stat, you know, new game plus. I would suggest getting wood up to around 40 just for extra health, as well as that spirit defense. Um, as for spirit sustainability and metal, we have a very sharp drop after 10. Going up to 10, you get about eight points per, and then it's gonna suddenly drop down to like three up to 22, and then it's gonna drop again after 22 all the way up to 50. So in general, I think 10 metal is gonna be kind of a baseline on a lot of builds, just cause having some spirit sustainability is gonna be nice. Uh, but man, the, the severe, it's a really, really fast drop past 10. Uh, as for stuff like spirit gain rate and spell duration, so the spirit gain rate on deflect and attack as well as spell duration on wood, those seem to be linear. Every two points invested is going to be 1% in those gauges. So, uh, you know, if I put two more points into wood, I'm up to 104 spell duration. If I go up to 10 wood, I'm up to 105. As far as I can tell, it's just a linear scale that just keeps going. Um, but I've only been able to test up to around 80 so far. So maybe it goes more past that. 
Uh, besides that, spirit consumption rate is a little bit trickier. So for martial arts, wizardry, and defects, you're going to see some soft caps there around 15, 30, and 46. So if you're looking uh, to, to cap on out on your consumption on you know wizardry or, or deflex or what have you, uh, the baseline would be going 15 in all three of these. And then if you want to go past that, up to 30. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is going to be equipment weight. This is going to start to cap off around 35 with Earth. Now, for the most part, a lot of these stat caps really aren't going to be all that important. Uh, I think taking wood up to 40 might be relevant in New Game Plus. And as you push further and further into the game uh, with, with the additional difficulties that I'm sure they're going to add. But for the most part, what I would recommend doing, I think Metal to 10 is important for Spirit Sustain. I think your secondary stat, for me, that's Earth. You want that at 30. And I think your primary is where you're going to be dumping most of your points. Besides that, for the two remaining stats, which in my case was Wood and Water, I'm only putting enough points to achieve the wizardry spells that I want from those particular elements. So pretty straightforward. Um, for a more in-depth dive into this, we'll talk about that in the build crafting video. But either way, let's actually move on. And next up, we're going to be talking about wizardry spells. Now, right up front, I want to be clear that as you play the game, you're going to have access to all of the wizardry spells. Just through leveling up, you're going to be able to learn every spell in the game. It's not like a pick and choose type thing, so there's no concerns there. Um, beyond that, just to be clear about the three numbers you see there, the first represents what uh, I need leveled up in that virtue to use it. The second is the morale level I need in the level to use it. And the third is going to be the spirit cost. So looking at something more advanced like Engulfing Inferno, I would need to have at least 25 Fire Virtue to even equip this, and I would need to be far enough in the level that my morale is up to 7 to use the ability, and it's going to cost 382 on my Spirit Gauge, which that number isn't going to matter. Just know it's going to be a, a decent chunk. It's going to be about a third of your Spirit Gauge on average. Um, but so taking a look at the, at the spells here, what I would like to do is I've had people asking, you know, what are the spells I would recommend focusing on? Um, I do want to be clear that spell effectiveness is tied to virtue. So, for example, with, with uh, my build, I have 6 wood and 57 fire. My lightning bolt is going to be significantly weaker than my fire bolt, just because I've put so much in fire. So, I went ahead and did testing by leveling a virtue up to 80, and then testing those elemental spells, and then respecking. Uh, while doing that, there were a couple that stood out to me. So to start in the wood face tree, I really like Barb Conductor. This is a little bit tricky to use. You grow a branch and then you recast it, uh, but this has, has a very high lightning application on targets, which is pretty good. Obviously super late game, but Heaven's Rage is one of the stronger spells in the game. Unfortunately, it's only really useful against the biggest targets because of the spread. Uh, probably the craziest thing in this tree is Absorb Vitality. I noticed a lot of people were trying to use this in one of the previous demos and they weren't using it right. The best way to use this is put it on either Y or Triangle, and when you stun an enemy and they're open for a critical attack, pop Absorb Vitality and then do the critical attack. And it's going to heal you up for about a third of your health every time you do that. So incredibly useful self-sustained spell when used in that context. Moving on over to Water. Uh, for casters, Frozen Malice is probably going to be your bread and butter for most of the game. You can get access to it pretty early. It's only going to be a 3 morale, so you can use it fairly early on in levels. It does decent damage as well as Frost application. Frozen Spear Trap is another one that I found really useful. Um, while the damage on it's okay, the Frost application in particular is quite high. Most of the time I was getting Frost applied with just two instances of this, which is really good. Lastly, Ominous Chill. This is quite possibly the strongest spell in the game. This thing is devastating. It does absolutely insane damage, and it should. It requires you to have 40 into ice. Uh, moving on into metal. Now, metal's a bit of a split bag. Uh, over with the debuffs, Life Wither is pretty busted. It requires 15 morale, so it's more of a final boss of the level type thing, but it just causes them to take more damage. It's great. Now, obviously, you want to maintain that, and that's going to be with Toxin, which with Toxin, Toxin Bubbles is the best by far until you get access to Venom Snare, which is incredibly endgame. Um, but yeah, Toxin Bubbles I found to be to be the best. Alternatively, a lot of the Toxin stuff was hard to really get build up going, so I think Toxin Weapon is a good alternative to make sure it's getting applied to your targets. Moving on to the Earth phase, uh, Sand Sink is actually one of the cooler abilities in the game. It doesn't do a lot of damage, it's not going to do a lot of build up, but it rips enemies in, and so you can combine it with other spells. For example, you can do a Sand Sink to drag them on in, and then immediately do an Imposing Slab to get damage. 
Uh, so very good CC. Uh, speaking of Imposing Slab, this is actually the Earth spell I used for a majority of my playthrough. Uh, it has solid heaviness build up on it, solid damage, and it forms like a temporary wall in front of you that's going to stop uh, some of the, the enemies that would try to strike you. Late game, I think transitioning to Fiend Vanquisher is the right move. This thing does insane earth build up and stun lock. Uh, super good, and it's like a long duration spell. Deathly Bog I like, um, but against more mobile enemies, I, th I think the utility starts to fall off against stuff that's bigger that's going to step out of it. Lastly, we have my tree, baby. Fire. Um, unironically, one of the best spells in the entire game, Blasting Flare. One of the first spells you can pick up. This thing is incredibly fast, does good damage, does good stagger. Uh, it's excellent as an interrupt. I still use this. This is one of my main go-to spells. Uh, besides that, really like Amplify Damage. If you're playing well, you take 50% more, you deal 50% more. So combining that with something like Blasting Fair, uh, I'm shooting out basically like 800 damage combustions. It's pretty nutty. Uh, besides that, I was a really big fan of Engulfing Inferno towards the end. This ended up being my nuke. If I had enough positive spirit, I could throw down like five or six of these and essentially just melt a boss, uh, which I actually do exactly that in my review of the game if you want to check that out. Uh, now, obviously, this isn't a comprehensive list. And like I said, you're going to unlock everything. So, you know, don't be too concerned about it. Feel free to, to try stuff out, test different things. Uh, these are just the spells that stood out the most to me. In terms of figuring out your spell layout, what I like to do is focus my primary element. So in this case, Blasting Flare, Amplify, Engulfing Inferno. And then I have the counter of my counter. And what I mean by this is since I'm primarily a fire build, water is my one weakness, I'm going to pull from earth, which can counter water. And this way I can use fire for pretty much everything. But if I go up against the enemy that is a water element, I'll be able to use Fiend Vanquisher to really deal some serious damage there since my fire stuff isn't going to deal as much. Uh, but with all that being covered, we're going to hop on over into the level and talk about combat. Now, combat in Wolong is pretty straightforward. We have our basic attacks, which we can do, and then we have our spirit attacks, which we can do. Uh, a good way to think of this is kind of like light attacks and then heavy attacks. Now, as I do spirit attacks, you'll notice that my gauge is filling on up, and that's my spirit gauge. Now, the typical way you would do spirit attacks is you'd go through a bunch of light attacks to build up spirit, and then you would do a spirit attack to spend that spirit. You'll also notice that if I do it after an attack, it's a different animation than if I do it from a stationary position. Uh, now, the main idea behind this is going to be if I were to get a bunch of attacks in, you can see that my gauge is building up to blue. And if I were to do a heavy attack, you can see I did 213. Doing that same attack, I ended up breaking a stamina. But doing that same attack when I don't have positive spirit, you can see I only did 149. And so the idea here is to attack and deflect and build up my spirit so that I can do a heavier attack to a target. Now besides that, I can also use my spirit on things like wizardry spells or alternatively on martial arts. Depending on what my morale rank is at will determine when I can use those wizardry spells. I'm currently at three morale, which is why I have these two spells active, but not my spell on X or B. And we're going to talk more about morale in just a little bit. Now, aside from our spirit attacks and our martial arts, which are on X and Y, deflects are obviously a big, big part of the combat here, and in particular, deflecting critical blows. Deflecting a critical blow is going to immediately end up winning an enemy, and when you do so, it's going to open the enemy up for you to do your own critical blow, which you would then hit the spirit attack button to go in and do a finisher. Uh, and this is going to be one of the main ways that you do damage in this game. A good way to think of it is... Getting an enemy's spirit gauge low enough is like doing a posture break in Sekiro and opening them up to a death blow. So you can certainly kill them without doing that, but going for those hits, those, those critical hits, is a huge way to get some damage in. Now, not only that, but I want you to notice that even if I'm not deflecting uh, those attacks, even if I'm just deflecting normal attacks, you'll notice how his spirit gauge is getting shorter and shorter, almost like it's being pinched. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with wind, where I said that wind is going to decrease the upper and lower limits of the spirit gauge. As we're deflecting this enemy, his spirit gauge is slowly shrinking. And so you can actually beat enemies purely through deflecting them here. You're not even going to have to actually ever attack this guy until it's time for the crit. I mean, his, his, his bar is going to instantly empty out any time I, I deflect a critical move. But in general, I could get that all the way to where just a normal deflect, or a normal deflect is going to put him into that state where I can then get the critical blow. And you can see he's almost there. It's taking a minute, but he is almost there. 
Uh, on the note of deflects, so of course you can just do a singular press to get a deflect, or you can tap the button twice to do a dodge. One thing I suggest doing that I found personally helps a lot is holding the block button and then going for a deflect. And what's gonna allow you to do with this is even if you miss a deflect, you can see block is gonna hurt your spirit a little bit, but what's nice about this is you're not taking any damage. So just holding block and going for your deflect I think feels a lot more natural than trying to just deflect outright. This is something that I found that uh, early on I, I made that, it, it made a really big difference on type of bosses. On top of that, the deflect is directional. So, you know, going forward with it, going backward with it, going left, going right. Uh, the direction doesn't totally matter, but if a enemy is charging at me, and I know I'm getting close, I'll deflect into them. If I'm struggling with the move, I might try deflecting backwards. It's just gonna depend on what the attack is like as it's coming at me. Um, some other things to talk about here, there there are some unique moves you can find. So for example, on, um, you know, on Thorncleave here, pulling up that description again, I can see that I can uh, hold this down and it's going to keep doing the number of slashes, and I can see there's an additional effect at high spirit that's gonna enhance the damage and prevent stagger from incoming attacks, except for powerful attacks, which would be critical attacks. So just to, to show an idea of that, high spirit is just considered blue. So if I was to do that and get into a little bit of blue, I actually got hit pretty hard there. I'm trying to, oh, let's do it, let's go. So now that I'm in blue, I can, and I can keep doing this and I have some, some poise while I'm doing it. And you can see that while I continue to do it, my spirit has gone from blue and it's now going down into the orange. Now, if I was to get hit while my spirit was all the way bottomed out, I would be winded. And at that point, my character would be vulnerable to, to getting hit with a heavier attack. Um, so in general, you don't want to let it get that low. But uh, parrying a critical attack is pretty much always going to put you back in. And I think this is this is important to know. All it really takes is going to be one parry of a critical, and you're going to be back at blue. So even in the most dire situation, you know, if I get this guy likes to, he seems to really like his criticals. So I'm pretty far in my orange. I'll let him get get my orange meter built up. You can see instantly back to blue. So really keep in mind, really practice, because getting the deflects on those attacks are going to make a really big difference in how effective you are. Now, briefly, I want to talk about, um, we talked about martial arts. There is the the deflect on top of X or Y for martial arts. If you have two weapons on and you're holding down R1 or your bumper and you hit B, it's going to do a weapon swap, and that also serves as a deflect right there. So you can see I did a deflect and a counterattack, and you can also deflect uh, criticals with that. So you can see... With that same move, and right now I'm just hitting like I'm, I'm, I'm constantly doing these these uh, these uh, right bumper and B attacks. Got a little too spammy with it there. I'll jump away. Um, the other thing is the the spirit. So you can see the spirit blinking next to the gauge. There are two ways to use this. You can hit Y and B to summon it up and attack, or you can hit X and A, and that's going to infuse you with it. Which in this case has infused me with toxic on my blade. Uh, now, a quick spoiler, because we are going to look at some spirit names here, but, uh, you know, they're just names. Uh, but hopping on over to Battle Preparation and Divine Beast, I can see what my spirit is going to do. So in this case, Teng Shi gives me damage to uh, enemies with negative effects on them. It's going to be status accumulation, wizardry spell damage, and then if I summon it, which would be triangle and circle, or Y and B, it's going to summon it to scatter poison all over the area. The attack range and variety is also going to increase above morale rank 10. This is true for all of the Divine Beasts. The Resonation is going to coat my weapon with Toxic. You can see, Summon Tang Shi to apply Toxic damage to your weapon. Increased damage and ailment accumulation dealt cannot be neutralized by five phases affinity. And that's one of the things that's nice about the Divine Beasts is the effects they apply cannot be neutralized. So even if I was fighting something that was uh, immune to, like a water thing, even if I'm fighting water, if I'm using the Phoenix, it's still going to get burnt because the Divine Beasts will supersede those five phases. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is your Fortitude rank and your Morale rank. Now, your Fortitude rank is seen in the top right of the screen. Right now, it says 3, and it's next to a downward pointed arrow. My Morale rank is seen right above my Health bar, and that is at 5. Now, your Fortitude rank is the lowest your Morale will drop down to when you die, 
and your morale is more of a indicator of how well you're performing in the level. Think of it like a temporary power level for that stage. So by killing enemies and by getting critical blows and whatnot, I'm gonna raise my morale. If I target these enemies, I can see killing, uh, I can see I'm getting different morale depending on which enemy I target. So targeting the zero, I'm gonna get to like the five or six o'clock position in terms of the experience I'd get. If I'm targeting the three, you can see I'm gonna get a lot more. And so higher level targets are gonna be worth more morale. You can see killing those dudes, I'm now up to a level six morale. And a level six versus a level one is gonna be a, a pretty big difference. Uh, in addition to that, using higher tier wizardry is going to require higher morale. Now, not only does morale make the level easier, but it can also be lost. So taking a look at this enemy, while I'm currently at 6, if I get hit by a critical attack, you can see it knocked me clean on down to 5. So it is possible to lose morale through getting hit with critical attacks. Um, so playing well will build your morale up. Playing poorly will cause you to lose it. Now, if I were to die, I would drop down to my fortitude rank, which is three. And to raise that, we need to find flags that are throughout the environment, either battle flags like the one we were just at, or marking flags. So I've already gone ahead and uh, there's one that's, that's right in here. I'm gonna have to go run around and grab that door. Uh, but your marking flags, they are, they are hidden all over the map and in a variety of different places. So you're gonna need to, to kind of go around and spend some time looking for these to find them. Uh, but when you do, they're pretty tucked away. So here's one, for example, I go on in, I hit that, and you can see my fortitude rank has now increased to four. And so if I go ahead and I die again, instead of dropping down to three, I would drop down to four. Now, it doesn't necessarily end there. Uh, we do have the potential to win back morale that was lost alongside our genuine chi, uh, or souls, or whatever you want to call it in this game. So right now, I have 31,000 genuine chi. This is our resource that we used to level up. I'm going to let this dude beat me up real fast. As I die, you can see I drop down exactly half of my genuine chi, as opposed to losing all of it, how you would lose all of your Amrita or all of your souls. You only lose half of it in this game. Now, not only do we lose half of it, but you'll notice that our morale rank is now down to four, which is what our fortitude rank was. But this enemy has a glow around his morale number. So if I kill him, I'm going to trigger revenge. Revenge accomplished. I have gotten back my genuine chi, and not only that, but you'll also notice I got back the morale rank that I had. So all the morale that I had had is now regained, uh, and I haven't really lost anything. You know, we're right back to where we were when we started. Uh, so the basic idea here is just playing smart is going to raise your morale, and you know, killing enemies that have killed you will get you revenge to get back lost morale and lost genuine chi. Uh, the only difference is on boss fights, anytime you walk into a boss arena, you're automatically going to recover any lost genuine chi or morale points when you attempt that fight. So if you were to play and get up to 25 morale and then go into a boss fight, as long as you're not being hit by critical attacks, you're going to have a consistent advantage every time you attempt that boss because you're going to have like a five level spread on it. So the last thing I want to cover is going to be respecking, and for that we're going to head back to town. I do want to touch on this because I actually missed this for a lot of my playthrough, uh, but hitting travel, you can then hit X, and then you will leave wherever you're at, and you'll go to the hub. You need to, of course, unlock the hub first, and this happens after the fifth main mission of the game. But, but definitely something, well actually you visit the hub before the fifth main mission, but you can't respec until after the fifth main mission. Uh, but either way, now that we are at the hub, let's talk about respecking, and that is right behind us over here with the Hermit. Uh, and honestly, the respecking in this game is nuts. So we just talk to this guy, reset parameters, and we just move him around. Let's say I don't want Earth as my secondary anymore. I decide I don't like it, and instead I want wood. Well, now I have one Earth, and instead I have 35 wood. And all I do is, is hit the button to confirm it, and that's it. I respect. That fast, that simple. It's it, it's kind of nuts, to be honest. Like, I've never seen such comfortable respecking before. Um, and not only that, but it goes a step further. So we are able to respec and save battle sets. So, for example, if I go here and I go to rest uh, under battle preparation, I have a battle set. Here I have my spell sword build that I'm currently playing with. Here I have a earth variation of that build. And you can change this in missions. Just hit apply. And now, whole new armor set, whole new weapons, 
And if we go over and we look at my stats, we can see I now have 56 earth. So if you want, in theory, you could create five different builds, save them as presets, and then as you're playing the game, freely swap between uh, a different build whenever you want. Literally, anytime you're at a battle flag, you can go battle preparation, battle set, and swap on over to a different build. So they, they have really done a vast improvement in terms of, of build flexibility. You know, you don't need to worry about, about needing an item or money or anything. And, um, you know, I really like it. I'm, uh, I, you know, as somebody that loves making builds, this is a, this is a huge change in my opinion. Um, but either way, that is going to wrap things up. So as I mentioned, I'm going to have a separate video looking in depth at, at the blacksmith and build crafting. Uh, that's also going to touch on the followers because they tie into build crafting. Um, but for now, I think this wrapped things up. Hopefully I, I covered a lot of the basics that people were curious about. And anything I didn't cover, hopefully I cover in the second video. But regardless, thanks for tuning on in. Hope this helps you on out. And hopefully you come on back for the walkthrough.